Aloha, everybody. Thank you, Jamika. Um, we're right in the middle of a very crazy part at the very beginning of the night in which we try to do about 50 times as much work in 10 minutes as we will for the rest of the night in terms of reconfiguring the instrument and desperately trying to capture some light from the sky as it gets darker and darker and darker to calibrate an instrument. And so for that reason, I have to keep turning myself on and off and looking over at things back and forth real quickly. But uh, as, as that process is going on, just to, to give you a, a sense of what we're doing, the, uh, the instrument this evening is KCWI, the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. Um, here in the, in the control room, we have the extremely awesome Rosalie McGurk and Shinsu Lee, who are two of our staff astronomers. Hiding back over behind the, the computer is Max Brodheim, who's from the Scientific Software Group, who writes all the code that makes all this happen. Um, Rosalie is the staff astronomer responsible for KCWI and was the lead person here at the observatory who helped uh, perform its major upgrade, which we are taking advantage of this evening, which uh, I will talk about when it gets a little bit less hectic. Um, and then uh, away across the United States, we have Rangman Bordeloy and Ahmed Shaban um, at, uh, in North Carolina, who are my collaborators working on some of the science tonight. So we're all over the map. Um, I put in the chat, if you're interested in um, a, a neat little uh, feed, and I'll, I'll copy it again just in case, uh, because it's it's real fun to watch live time the domes when they are zipping around. Uh, and I'll put that in the chat once again here. That's a YouTube link if you want to load up the other thing where there's a camera on the Subaru telescope aimed at the Keck domes. Um, and it's lots of fun. It's it's, it's a really fun one to watch uh, when there's uh, laser adaptive optics nights going because you can see the lasers going all over the place. But tonight we're doing optical wavelength observing. So no adaptive optics. Um, I've got to check in on where we're at for a moment. Um, and I will be right back, but uh, I'm just going to point point you over at sort of what I see. And uh, I'm just going to check one quick thing. So and just so that I don't drive people insane periodically, I'm going to mute my um, my microphone on this Zoom because we've got a second Zoom going and lots of cross chatter. But um, exposure. it's a beautiful Please. night up above Mauna Kea this evening. Extremely clear skies, only a little bit of uh, thin cirrus. The forecast is for a, a lovely night of observing. Uh, Right as after the sun sets, things get settled in a little bit. Um, the atmosphere becomes less and less turbulent. And uh, the predictions, I don't believe them, but the predictions are for, for conditions which are really phenomenal. Um, I say I don't believe them because I have the unfortunate ability to make the conditions get worse simply when I walk into a room. Um, this is not a, a, a skill you really want as a, as a chief scientist for an observatory. And so that's why all my collaborators like to observe remotely without me being in the room with them because then it just makes things things bad but so far things are going well um and oh i forgot to to aim camera over here complete. up top is john who is our Wait. telescope operator he's he's driving the bus for us this evening way up at the top of the summit and I apologize to John for all the noise that he's getting in the background. <laughs> I'll try to mute the Zoom over here on this end to make things a little bit less painful for you. Um, no worries. Let's see. So what we're doing right now, in fact, I'll mute it for John for a bit since we're going to be here for a little bit longer. Um, what we're doing right now is what we call a process of twilight flats. So. Instruments on, on telescopes are not like the cameras in your iPhone where you get the same picture all the time, every time. And that's in, in your iPhone camera because they've spent a lot of time trying to make the detectors do things. And in software, they can do very interesting things um, to the images. The detectors in, in telescopes uh, instruments are very, very, very sensitive beasts. And they're sensitive at different functions of wavelength. And for that reason, 
Um, one of the things that we do at the beginning of a night or even in the afternoon is to get the instrument ready through a process of calibration Excellent. where we try to figure out the response of the of, of the system. And one of the best ways to do that is to aim it at the sky just after sunset because the sky is very bright in blue light just after sunset. And a lot of the lamps that we have or the calibration systems that we have at the observatory are not as bright in blue and ultraviolet light. And so this is this process of twilight flats where you're aiming the telescope just at nothing on the sky. And the sky is way too bright to be doing any science. Um, and that gives you stuff that looks DCD like DCD readout this. complete. So this is just the night sky as it passes through the instrument and gives you a sense of, you know, just how things are working. It looks like we've actually saturated something over on the red side, which means the telescope was just too good at getting the light. But uh that's okay when when we're doing it um, when we're just doing twilight observations because uh, you know they if it doesn't if the twilight observation doesn't work you can use stuff from uh, the the archive. I see that Raja has joined us. Hey Raja, how's it going? Good to see you. Uh, for those who don't know the Shadow of the Scientist program, uh, Raja is 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 the the lead of this along with Jamika in in this wonderful program. So thanks y'all for for joining us and Raja, thank you for for joining me tonight. Um, Raja knows very well the uh, the extreme hectic panic that happens when you're trying to get all of your twilight flats done in enough time because the earth is rotating just too fast and the, the sky is getting dark very quickly. Um, but fortunately for me, I've got I've got Rosalie and Shinsu uh, doing the twilight flats for me so that I can babble away incoherently. Let's see, after the twilight flats are done, then we're going to um, go to one of our uh, standard stars. That's another way that we calibrate the instrument. We look at a star where we know the amount of light as a function of wavelength from the star. And you need to know that because your science target, you don't know on average how much light as a function of wavelength is coming from that thing. And so you need a comparison thing that is a known quantity so you can kind of divide it out and get the true amount of light from the astronomical object. And so that's the process of a standard star. Um, it takes a little bit of time on the sky, but it's a rather important thing to do um, if, if you want to um, know the total amount of light from, from your object. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute for a quick second just while we, we see how things are going over in the, in the twilight flat world and, and chat real quick with my collaborators just to make sure that our, our night plan is there. Um, but... Uh, I'll I'll be back in just one second. In fact, I'm going to leave it unmuted so you can you can listen to the the sort of DCD witty banter that can only complete. happen in the panic of twilight flats. But I'll be right back. Thirty thousand looks good. Yeah. So, uh, Ramon, are you there? Yes. Okay. So, are are you cool with the the plan of I'm just going to hit the standards. Um, I'm probably not going to hit the standards for the large slicer right now just because we can get that from the archive if it doesn't go well um i'm going to get the, the the standards for the two mediums then go over to um that quad that absent um and uh, although the yeah because i need the sky to get dark enough to be able to to do any of that stuff and so i'll, I'll do the standards first but and then i'll go to the to the one that we put in Slack just a couple hours ago. How much time do you think you want to spend on that? Do you know how much time that was in your Google report? Exposure complete. Hello. 36. So we spent like uh, almost an hour, I think. Okay. I don't know if we can get that much. Yeah, even if we get half an hour, that's that's good. Okay. I'll probably do 40 minutes, but pretty good. Okay. DCD readout complete. We'll be doing lower resolution, probably your signal will also be fit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that'll be the plan. And and I know you were thinking of bouncing for a bit, right? Yeah, I'm gonna uh, head out. I haven't really slept in the last two weeks. 
Sleep is important, unless it's me. I'm not allowed to sleep right now. But so uh, I'll rejoin you guys, um, like in what, in five hours or okay. whatever, like six a.m. here or so. Cool. All right. Um, thing. So I think like Ahmed, you'll be around, right? Yeah. Most of the night I'll be here. Okay. Sounds okay. good. I'll see you all in the morning then. Okay. Cool. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, one of the one of the neat things about uh, observing at Keck compared to a lot of observatories is the the kind of dialogue that we just had right now, um, in which we are figuring out whether or not we're going to change our mind with the plan. Keck is a, a classically scheduled observatory, which means you can change your mind up to the very last second um, in your in your night plan. That has a lot of advantages. Um, other observatories do what's called queue observing, which has a different flavor of advantages, which is they can schedule things based off of the conditions on the sky and only execute a program when certain things are going in a certain way. But um, when the conditions are great and you want really want to optimize your, your time, or if you learn something interesting in the first couple of hours that you want to keep exploring and change your mind and all that good stuff, that's where classical observing comes in. And so you know, we'll find um, over the course of the night, we'll probably change our mind five or six or seven or 26 times. That's usually the way that I that I observe just to try to get the most science per second exposure out of the night. Complete. Um, you, you keep hearing these bings and bongs about exposure complete. That's just the instrument reading out as as we're, we're aiming at the sky. So in, in a few minutes, we're going to begin the process of going over to these, these standard stars. And I can show you what the the process of acquiring a um, an astronomical object looks like because right now we're looking at nothing on purpose, um, but soon we're going to start looking at stars. And then when we start the real long exposures, I'll explain um, what the heck it is we're doing tonight scientifically and why we need Keck for it and why we need this instrument for it. Um, so you know, I, I I apologize if there's going to be periods of of sort of blank nothingness while I move around and scurry about and try to get things there, but uh, it should be should be a little bit of fun. And um, ideally, when the data comes in, I can start to to show you what it, what it looks like. CTD readout complete. So let's see. I'm going to mute for just one second. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks like it has a star right next to the problem. Okay, now we're ready. All right. So now we're going to start actually looking at things. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is these standard stars, these things that I talked about before. Um, the What happens when you acquire an astronomical object is you have a list of things that you want to do. But at, at Keck, the astronomer operates the instrument. The telescope operator runs the telescope. So there's this CCD readout response complete. that always happens back and forth between the astronomer and, and the operator, which is, okay, I wanna do this, this next thing. And uh, they'll look up the, the, the thing based off of the star list that we gave them, move the telescope there. And once they're happy and in position where we think we wanna observe, we execute the observation. Um, right now, what we have to do is we haven't yet focused the telescope, right? We didn't need the telescope to be particularly well focused to look at bright background sky. It's not particularly useful. So we have to go and focus the telescope. The The telescope is this massive configuration of that. That is the, uh, the sound that one of the instruments makes when it's done. Um, the, you know, the Keck telescope is 300 plus tons of, of, of steel and zero door glass and various other things. And over the course of the day, it will start to change its shape and wait not based off of where it's pointed in the sky and the temperature and all that stuff. And so every night 
you have to focus it to start the night. Um, and that's what we're, we're we're setting up the process of doing right now. Um, and just to just look at a spot. So we're start we're we're starting that process of actually focusing up the telescope. Um, and let's see if I can let's see forget if anything interesting happens during the mirror, but what I'll do, let me bring this over here and sort of show you what I see when I'm observing. Um, got all these various screens, and so I can kind of walk through what they are. This instrument has two um, channels, a red channel and a blue channel. The red channel is the brand new one, um, and the data from that red channel is coming over here. Uh, Rosalie has very helpfully made it appear red on the screen so that I know which one is which. Um, the, the blue channel data is coming over here. Um, Did you want the segment star? Hmm? The segment star. Oh. Second so, okay, cool. So we're actively focusing the telescope. You see this pattern here. Each one of these is the uh, light from the star bounced off of an individual segment. And we use a complicated system of things that I don't understand because I just don't understand giant telescope optics to basically take the star, move the segments around a little bit, see how they move in this image. And then software tells you what is the optimum way to then reconfigure those mirrors so that you get a well-focused image? So it's very different than say focusing a, a, a manual type camera. You're actually focusing sort of 36 cameras at once and the software is, is much smarter than I am and figures out the best way to do that. Um, so we look at a very bright star on the sky and, and go through this process. The process usually takes about 10-ish minutes or a little bit less than that, um, depending on the, the, the style that you do it. But it's really important that you do it because if you're going to, um, use the largest telescope in the world, you want it uh, as, as best focused as you can. Defocused images from telescopes um, just give you suboptimal data. You're getting less science per second if your telescope is, is poorly focused. So, you know, this image will update as, as various things go on, um, but it's, it's more just an illustration of, hey, this is how the mirrors look like on the big giant mirror of Keck is actually 36 little mirrors spread out um, oh, in this in this fun pattern. Do, 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 do. So let's see, what else do I see when I'm when I'm staring at stuff? Um, over over on this screen here is just where we can tell the instrument, hey, which configuration should you be? You can set the instrument to gather different light from different wavelengths. You can tell it to um, look at higher or lower resolution, which is always a trade-off. Um, and then you know, hiding over here is the zoom link that we have um, with the telescope operator. And then basically, Rosalie and, and Chen Su have the exact same view that I do. We sort of yep. mirror all of those screens so that they're able to control the instrument in the exact same way. I'm really lucky to have them here tonight because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do both of these things at once. But hey, you know. Um, and then uh, the fun thing is that um, we have software um, for remote observing, which allows people to operate the telescope from other places okay, on the planet. Finished. I got about point eight for the C. Um, Great. Are you the and I got the camera? Right. And then uh, I got BD thirty three at Red Bay. Whenever you're ready. Oh. Great. Thank you. Um, so we're not quite ready to take. Actually, you can take your image. Go ahead on the left hand most screen, John. Yeah. And take grab your image. The nice green button right here. The nice oh green button. This nice green button. Oh, um, nice green button. <laughs> you take guider image. You mean the green button that says take guider image on it? No, that one. The one that says do the thing that you should be doing. <laughs> not trying to force you to do anything. You don't want it. <laughs> and there it is. This is the box. Okay. Yes, it is. And it's got a friend. Great. Right. So John C, can you offset this to KCWI? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I have to call it. 
Okay, three, 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 Exposure complete. Sorry for the pause there. We've set up that helpful system of boxes shows exposure a star complete, and then that helpful chorus of exposure complete tells me that we we got the exposure done. Um, we're looking at a very bright star, and very bright stars don't take very long uh, with a ten meter telescope. In fact, it takes much longer for the detector electronics to read out the data than it does to acquire the object when you're looking at something this bright. Um, and once that comes, that, that light comes in, we'll know whether or not we got the exposure time. The time. readout complete. Survey says. Yeah. Hmm? DCD readout complete. I think that's three. Yeah, I think that's that's go three. All right. That. 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 Okay. Okay. <laughs> so let's see if we can see what's going on over here. Yeah, there's there's these magic control screens where you have to set the exposure time here and here. Um, and then you get these happy little progress bars marching along. The, the optics of the system are differently sensitive to red and blue light. And as a result, you don't spend the same amount of time looking at the object in one wavelength as another. And it really depends on the flavor of the object. Some stars have a lot more blue light than they do red light, and other stars have a lot more red light than they do blue light. With these standard stars, we know exactly what kind of stars we're looking at. Um, and as a result, you know, this this star is, is a very, very hot star, which means it has a lot more blue light than it does red light. Um, the other thing, which I can go into in detail later, is that... DCD readout, readout complete. complete. Oh, that, uh, that the, um, the detector electronics... Uh, for the red channel and the blue channel. Those look yummy. Okay. Number two. Oh yeah. Number two. And then I guess we'll go over to You want to take one more of the red. Because one. of cosmic rays. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Then we will go to medium one. Medium then we'll go over to medium two. Yes. Cool. And I and I think then we'll just figure for large and I'll get a standard for large later. Okay. Cool. So what is what is all this bobbly gook I'm talking about with configure for large and medium and small? Um, this is this trade-off that you have to make between whether or not you want very high resolution. That means you can see very high detail in the spectrum. But to do that, that means you're passing the same light through more real estate on the detector which means each individual pixel on the detector is getting less light per second than if you did lower resolution, which is faster, but you learn less. DCD readout and complete. You always have to make this trade-off um, when you're... DCD readout complete. <laughs> you're getting this lovely chorus of CCD readout complete. Um, this trade-off is, is really important to balance because telescope time is precious. Um, if you had infinite telescope time, which nobody does, um, not even the deputy director, you, 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 you would want to do everything at high resolution all the time because that's when you learn the most. But um, really, really faint things are very, very hard, hard to do at resolution. And this instrument is arguably the best in the world at doing a certain flavor of resolution and spectroscopy, which I'll go into when we've got more time to, to babble about. Um, 
it's one of the most sensitive uh, spectrographs in in the world, and so we you know we we look we tend to look at very very faint things, not these standard stars which are super bright. You know, the things that we'll be looking at um, in a in a few minutes are about ten thousand times fainter than the stars that we're looking at here. So DCD readout complete. DCD readout complete. <laughs> If you've go, gone away with one thing this evening, I really hope it's that we do a lot of repetition in astronomy and that we 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 listen to to detectors announce the fact that they're done over and over and over. You can ask why the heck would you torture yourself like this having to listen to that? It's because at three in the morning, if you're starting to nod off and you don't you aren't paying attention, you could miss the exposure ending, fall asleep and waste a bunch of time. And so instead we have this annoying chorus of CCD readout at complete telling you, hey, uh, go ahead and wake the heck up and uh, uh, get back to science. We even turned off the other noises on. You're only getting readout complete, not exposure complete. Well, yes, yes, there's there's exposure complete. There's um, on- configuration noises on 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 a different instrument at Keck there's a very angry gentleman who tells you the difference between CCD readout complete and blue CCD readout complete <laughs> and um you can do horrible things like configure the um the, the electronics to make a toilet flushing sound or a cowboy yelling yahoo or or various other things I uh, and and I can tell right now that that Rosalie is monkeying around with the system to try to make the, the most annoying sounds that we can. Um, in general, I just like the dulcet tones of CCD readout complete. Um, but what we're doing right now is we have to do this standard star for all of the configurations of the instrument. <laughs> And while Rosalie tortures me with cow noises in the background, Rosalie is also um, configuring the instrument and 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 configuring the instrument unfortunately takes time. And the reason why it takes time is that these instruments are exceedingly precise. The, the, the positioning of the optical elements within the instrument has to be to much less than the width of a human hair for it to be successful. And so for that reason, you know, they, they can move uh, and in large, directions pretty fast, but then there's fine tuning to get it exactly right. And all this happens internal to the instrument. And if you want it that precise, you have to wait. Um, and I'm a horribly impatient person, but this is actually worth it because then the instrument is in a state that allows me to, to, to do great science. So once we get um, these, these standard stars done, um, we're going to uh, then move to the first science field. And when I get started on the first science field, I can actually explain what the heck it is we're doing <laughs> instead of listening to cow noises and CCD readout complete. But you know, that it's it's the little things that matter. Um, Rosalie's having way too much fun over there. CCD record. readout complete. We're, we're not all very, very serious people all the time here at the observatory. Look good? Yeah. Awesome. And I'll, I'll probably do one of the most important things that you can do over the, the, the course of the night once the, um, the standard star configuration- DCD readout complete. Gets going is is I'm going to have to make a cup of coffee because I've been up all day and then I get to be up all night. But that'll be happening in a few minutes. Um, if there are any specific questions you have about what you're seeing, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, we'll probably not do a lot of back and forth discussion with open mic simply because we've got so many people listening in so many ears. But if you have a question about what you've seen so far or anything like that, please don't hesitate to put a question in the chat. I'd be del delighted to, to answer it when I'm not giggling about CCD readout complete. Um, DCD readout complete. <laughs> apropos of nothing. Let's see. So that's the, is that the, the second blue? The second blue, okay. Um, so I upped the red. This is our first red. First red, okay. And we'll do three red because of cosmic.
I was talking to Jim about that, this prevalence question. We're not sure if it's something directly nearby, or, but it has, but the picture has kind of one shooting that you're showing. Yeah. So. But I thought it's twin, I, th I thought basically it's twin was Al Res Red, right? So because. Yeah. I stand by that the they look different on the KCWI than LRS. I think there's something else. Because the cost the problem cost and grace on the red side is they're super faint. They're less than a thousand counts. So the edge threshold of cost and grace. CCD readout complete. Hmm. We're we're talking about these things called cosmic rays, which um are particle charge charged particles that can either come from the sun or much farther out in the universe. The problem with them is that they smack into the detectors that we use to capture light. These these detectors are called charge couple devices, and the way a charge couple device works is light comes in, and silicon is very well tuned to have its electrons jump up if the light from the right wavelength hits it. That's great for detecting light in, inside the silicon. What's not great is when these charged particles go through the same uh, detector, they can also uh, mimic a, a very bright light source. And they basically make uh, very bright, uh, narrow features on there that, that are just noise and annoying things. And they're completely random in their shape. Um, and uh, the only way you can really get rid of them algorithmically is to take many pictures of the same thing and then look for what changed, and you can subtract off that bit. DCD readout complete. Kyle asks, regarding twilight flats, this is a common calibration step. In astrophotography, does Keck also require dark and bias calibrations as well? Yes, Kyle, we do um, flat fields internal. We do wavelength calibration DCD internal. readout complete. We do twilight flats. Darks and biases are done um, right on the chip. It's read off on the chip and um, in the afternoon as well. Um, and, and Jamika asks, you know, can you explain the difference between the circumgalactic and interstellar medium? I definitely will. Once we get started on the science target, which should be happening fairly soon. Um, I just wanted enough time to be able to explain it without, uh, in, in, interrupting, uh, various things. So I will get to that. I promise as soon as I can, Jamika. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Getting ready for the science exposure. First one will be index number one, should be highlighted. And so I'm going to have to pay attention for a second on this because we're going to go through the process of um, alignment. Um, and on a faint target, that can actually uh, take a bit. So uh, I just have to pay attention to it because I need to be able to recognize the field that we're DCD at. readout complete. But what I'll do to help visualize things for y'all. So I'm going to put up this screen. I'm going to share the screen, which will show um, the process of alignment. Can I see you step away? DCD readout complete. We are ready to move. Sorry for the poor warning. Heather, Heather forbid you will be allowed to get coffee or something. How dare you. And Johnny, you want to cover the medium too? Um, this one. This is large. Yeah, this is large. Yeah, we just did the standards on the mediums only. Yep. Now we're going to large. Now we're going to large. Got it. And zero sky view. And zero sky view. Okay. okay. Let's see. We'll move to a different screen for a second for you all to look while I'm doing this. Deep. Are your objects at ref now? Okay. Ready to align them? I am. Yep. So I'm taking guided image? Pull up my field here. Charge. Uh, thanks, Buzzy. I'm not very. Um, how do 
don't think that's your option. There should be one bright guy, and then there should be a number of, of faint things nearby it. Those things. Let's see, Compass Roses North. Oh. Yeah. Hey, John. Tell here, can you take a slightly longer guider time? Sure. Thank you. What wavelength is the new angular guider in? Basically red. Uh, not has more detail, John. Um, if you're expecting to see cute pink fuzzy things, there are definitely some big, cute fuzzy things. Okay. John P, did you check pointing before we came? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to verify. Okay. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, so I'm just we're not rushing because we're still changing grading. So yeah, you have a minute. So I'm just going to move, let's see, I want to move the bright thing down so the telescope goes up, correct? You can just move the bright thing down. You use the down button. The down button. Oh, you mean the down button. Okay, we're going to go down in three arc seconds. Great. And then go ahead and take another. Hmm? And da, 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 da. just going to move one more arc second down. Down. Take the guider again. Is the sky still bright? So, what you're seeing on the screen out there in Zoomland is a camera that picks off the light surrounding the field so that we can tell where the telescope is pointing. Um, the big bright blob right under where my, my mouse is, the big bright blob there is a quasar. It's called a quasi-stellar object. It's um, only about uh, 4 billion light years away. Um, so, okay. If that's aligned. Yes. Okay. John P, can you send it down to East the Drive? Can it mark base? Yes, please. Nine. Oh, sorry. I left my house. Oh. Sorry, guys. One, two. Okay. It is at Case W right now and driving. Great, thank you, John. Oh, yeah, 1320, right. And this is four? Four. Okay. We golden? Oh, you got this. Yay, okay. So, <laughs> um, now I can explain what the heck it was. I'm doing it. <laughs> Um, so what we're looking at is a quasar. The quasar is a very bright central engine of a black um, of a galaxy where a supermassive black hole lives. The supermassive black hole is eating a lot of stuff, um, and it gets very very bright when it does this. I'll show you a better image of this, which is from here. Um, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of that same field that we're looking at. Very nice high spatial resolution um, because it's a telescope in space. But that big bright thing, the quasar, is a really neat way of looking at the universe in between us and the quasar. And this gets to Jamaica's question about the circumgalactic medium. Um, I use quasars as background light bulbs. And the reason why I do that is I, I now have a very, very bright thing, very, very far away in the universe. And if along the way there is 
a cloud of gas and dust and various other things, the light from that quasar will get absorbed by that galaxy or that cloud of stuff. And in fact, when you look at this, this Hubble image, you can see lots of little fuzzy things around it. You know, there's there's the thing just to, just above the quasar, there's a galaxy over in, in various other places. And those, those fuzzy things um, will leave an absorption signature in the line of sight towards the quasar. And that absorption signature goes way beyond, physically way beyond the spatial extent of the galaxy. And we call the stuff surrounding these galaxies the circumgalactic medium. So circum just meaning it's around it. Galactic medium is the, the is just the stuff surrounding galaxies, the halo of gas surrounding galaxies. We can't see this halo in starlight. It doesn't make enough light for us to be able to see. Um, but what we can see is it in silhouette. We can see it when its light, uh, when its atoms eat up the, the, the light from the quasar. And so what I'm doing is science in silhouette. I can't see this circumgalactic medium. I can't see the atoms that are doing it, but I know that they're there because they're absorbing light from the background quasar at specific frequencies that let me infer their existence. And I can do a lot more than know that they're there. Because I know how atomic physics works, and because I believe that atomic physics works the same everywhere in the universe and every when, um, I can do chemistry on these clouds, even though the light left them 4 billion years ago. And so that's what we're going to be doing with this instrument. We're going to be looking at the absorption of those clouds and we'll understand because we know how atomic physics works, what it's made out of, what its temperature is, how far away it is, how it might be moving um, relative to other clouds nearby. Uh, Raj has got a hand up. John, I wanted to ask a Quick follow-up question to your explanation, and then I'll disappear and I'll reconnect before the end of the SDS session. Sure. So you said that the, um, um, you talked about extent, right? So what we're seeing in that Hubble image is uh, the light of stars in the galaxy. Yes. And then you're saying that the, the gas, ionized gas is more extended than the stars, uh, but it's still associated with the same galaxy. Oops. Um, now, and there's dark matter as well, which we can't see. That's also extended and um, affiliated with the same galaxy. Yes. Um, and I assume the dark matter is the most extended of the three, and then the circumgalactic medium and, and, and most compact is the stars? Basically, yes. So if, if, if my fist is the starlight that we see in that galaxy, the circumgalactic medium which is still gravitationally associated to that galaxy. So it's bound to that galaxy. It's not just freely floating out. Is If this is a typical galaxy in stars that you can see, the circumgalactic medium is about this big. Okay, And so it is filling up significantly more volume surrounding that. But it's not dense enough to be creating a lot of stars of its own yet. Um, right. and then, you know, my arms spread wide roughly speaking, is about the extent of the dark matter halo that that says this is why you even have a galaxy there instead of just the sp empty space between galaxies. So there's another factor in this, which is what's called the intergalactic medium. And the intergalactic medium is the stuff in between all of those things. And that stuff is not bound to galaxies. It tends to actually follow wherever the dark matter is going. And the dark matter makes up this filamentary structure at very, very large scales, much, much wider than my arms in that example with galaxies called the cosmic web, which is hilarious because this instrument is called the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. It was an instrument designed to trace the atoms which are following this, this web-like structure of atoms um, in the universe that follows the dark matter. Jamika mentioned the interstellar medium. CCD readout oh, complete. That's, that's the first of the red exposures. And so I'm going to want to see really quickly how well that came out. There you are. Yeah. Look at those emission lines. Mm -hmm. Look at those tasty <laughs> emission lines. Okay. Yeah, there's another one up there. <laughs> um, so 
in my fist is where all the starlight was. And there's not just stars in galaxies. There's this, the atoms and dust and gas in between the stars and galaxies. And that's called the interstellar medium. So, you know, our solar system is embedded in the interstellar medium. Um, and it, that interstellar medium fills um, a lot of the space inside of galaxies. Um, it's not smoothly distributed in any way whatsoever, but it's sort of the atomic thing in between the stars. The circumgalactic medium is the stuff that's surrounding the galaxy. All of those things are at various layers of density. The interstellar medium tends to have more atoms per meter cubed than the circumgalactic medium, which has fewer. The intergalactic medium has very few. In fact, it's about 20 atoms of hydrogen per cubic meter. And if you think of how small an atom of hydrogen is, that's not a lot of stuff. Um, and so that, I remember the number of one atom per cubic centimeter of neutral hydrogen in the interstellar medium. That's sort of roughly the number I yeah. remember. In the ISM, one per cubic centimeter, not meter now. Yeah, so there's a lot of them in a cubic meter. In a cubic meter, exactly. In the interstellar medium. Which, if you compare that to the air we're breathing right now, <laughs> is much more, you know, you know, 10, 16 orders of magnitude, roughly speaking, more, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a cool way of saying space is mostly empty. Um, on average, if you point anywhere in the universe, you don't have a whole lot of stuff. We live in a very strange part of the universe where there's a ton of atoms. Um, it's not strange in the sense that there's a ton of atoms there. It's just, you know, it's it's fun to contemplate that, you know, we live in a particularly unique part of the universe where there's such a dense concentration of atoms, and that's because we live next to a star. And and that stuff formed out of the interstellar medium about five-ish billion years ago. Um, and John, the best vacuums we've ever created on Earth still have more atoms per cubic centimeter or cubic meter than the interstellar medium. And this is sort of, so the, so the universe is an exter external laboratory. It, it creates conditions that we can't create here on Earth. And then I had one last quip, and then I promise I'll run away. You, you <laughs> mentioned that the galaxy's CGM, circumgalactic medium, absorbs light, but it does very specific wavelengths. Most of the light of the quasar still gets through. That's why it looks so bright on that image. Right? That's yes. why you're taking a spectrum too. That's right. What wavelength yeah, I, I didn't go into the, because I, I keep looking at the screen to make sure that things are work, working well. Um, but yes, the, the quasar is exceedingly bright at all wavelengths. And so we get these notches out of the brightness from the quasar as a function of wavelength because of the atoms in some individual galaxy in between us and the quasar. That's why they're really, really good tools. And what I'm going to do later in the night is something that only an instrument like KCWI could do which is instead of using a quasar, a single dot on the sky, I'm going to replace the quasar with a galaxy that's been spread out on the sky by gravitational lensing, where you know the, it's distorted out on the sky and makes a big arc. And the reason why I want to do that is because when I look at a quasar, I'm really only looking at one tiny, 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 tiny part of the sky. It's only going through one tiny part of the cloud um, of, of surrounding a galaxy. And that's kind of like the 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 blind people poking the elephant, right? One of them pokes the trunk and one of them pokes the tail and one of them pokes the, the foot. In the case of the galaxy, you're only poking one part of the elephant. And that doesn't tell you much about what an elephant looks like. And so instead, if I could poke multiple places across the elephant, I can kind of figure out what an elephant looks like. And the background galaxies being stretched out by gravitational lensing now is kind of like lining up a bunch of quasars next to each other and making a big shape on the sky so that I can probe what the what the circumgalactic medium looks like in many different dimensions across that. It gives me 3D information about what the circumgalactic medium. This has never really been done before. And the reason for that is because it takes a very, very large telescope. It takes a very, very sensitive instrument and it takes a lot of luck to be able to have those big galaxies spread out on the sky. And we've only gotten very good recently at building all three of those things, right? We have to build giant surveys to look for these gravitationally lensed objects. We have to build really, really big telescopes like Keck, and we have to have really, really sensitive instruments like KCWI that allow us to see these things. And so that's a lot of fun and it's kind of a new field that we're building. Um, 
as we go along the way. What I'm going to do real quick is just take a quick look over this. I'm going to just pause for one quick second um, and CCD readout that all complete. important cup of coffee because I, I'm in desperate need of it and, and I'll be right back. Um, and so if you have a, a question you'd like answered, go ahead and put it in the chat and I will be right back. Both are legit. So I'm back. I have the most important thing on the planet to getting this done right. Um, Kyle, you ask roughly how long of a gravitational lens galaxy are you hoping to use? Um, these, so the instrument field of view, um, and term field of view just re re refers to what swath can you look at on the sky? This instrument field of view is around 20 arc seconds by 30 arc seconds. The gravitational lenses that we'll see are maybe a few arc seconds across on the sky, um, which is you know not a lot, but there's, there's many, many pixels that that spreads out the, the light over. And so we can sample each one of the individual pixels. Um, oh, is that, do we have the standard star? Look at that, very strange. Is it fluxed? What? Why is it? F oh, no, that's not fluxed. Okay. No. <laughs> I just, I was just trying to see what we're looking at. Let's see if I can share the screen. I can't show that at the moment. Um, but yeah, let me see, Kyle, if I can find you a good um, example. 
88 red should be an object. Uh, that's an object. Um, so I think if you just, if on QFIT's view, if you just drag, um, if you just take your mouse from here and then over there, it'll chop off that middle part. Well, now it's got to get still. What is the most recent? There you go. Nice little query. What was the most recent? Uh, 88. Oh, 89? Well, is reading it, out oh, reading out 90. Okay. So, um, Rosalie, can you do me a favor? Can you hit, uh, instead of single, smack median and pull the stretch? DTD readout complete. Let's see. Sorry, folks. We're just trying to. There you go. There's our friends. All right. Can I pull up the screen? Which VNC is this? Control zero. Control zero. Oh, there we go. Okay. So what you're looking at is one of the exposures that we've got. Um, that big bright thing there is, is the quasar. And so um, what I'm interested in is actually some stuff that's down below the quasar and above the quasar. It turns out that there is a group of galaxies in between us and the quasar, and it's got O2 emission just, or O2 absorption just, and that's the technical term, by the way, is just stretched out gas all over in a tube, basically linking where the quasar is um, on, on the sky and, and a couple of other things on the sky. And it's only with an instrument like like KCWI that you can get um, sensitivities enough to see it. So if hover the mouse right up this window down here, now let's see if we can get see that bam. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, L on the keyboard. Then drag your mouse on either side of this and, and hold down the C button. C. Right. Yeah, just on on left side drag to hold C and then to the right side. Actually hold C down. Oh. And then drag the mouse across. Oops. Yeah. Uh, and how do I go out? Uh, well. As if, if, if you hold C while you drag horizontally across, that maps it out and that's the two. Let me try to figure out how to get out of Can I drive for two seconds? Yes. <laughs> All right, let's see. Not a good master yet. You will be all right, so what we're going to do is if I hold C while I drag across like this, mm -hmm. boom. Ooh, pretty. Like this. Can I reset it? Yes. When was that? Uh, the IQW eighty eight, I think. Uh, I take it back. I think it was the no sky so but that might still work. There you go. 
That's cute. That's cute. That too just goes all over the place. Cool. It's a lot of fun. There you go. And then the other fun thing is, is that there's there's galaxies at the redshift of the tube, so it's an overdensity of scanning. Yeah. Da, 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 da. yeah. So the good news is that that means the instrument works and does exactly what I wanted it to do, um, because we're 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 seeing atomic emission by gas which you would otherwise not see, um, but because we can look at very very specific wavelengths, we can actually see this massive filament of gas that's going oh, hundreds of thousands of light years long. And we're seeing the um, atoms of oxygen um, and hydrogen in that filament. And what will happen is, you know, this this is data just as it came off of the telescope. So we haven't really optimized yet. We haven't added things together. We haven't done a, a lot of things. Um, and that uh, that process of adding the data up will make the data quality better um, and let us learn lots of fun things about um, the, the the gas in that in that tube. Um, so I think, let's okay. see, we're just going to do this one okay. a tube. And so we're reading out, which and means I've got to get ready out. for our next object, which will be DCD readout complete. DCD readout complete. Jock, you um, refresh the, the star list on your end? Okay. Right. Yep, I can reload it. Thank you. It's possible that for some reason it didn't. Yeah. Okay, I've loaded it. Oh. Okay. Maybe it didn't load on this and let me just um dang it. Do 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 do. Save as, save now, close. All right, we'll try it one more time, John. Okay, there we go. Um, can we move to index 27, the thing that's called new quad? Um. Large for this guy? We'll do large, 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 large. We've actually, you know, set an instrument configuration called large, large, large because you know we we don't have nearly enough uh, silliness going on. Um, Richard Bader asks: Is the spectrum distorted when you sample light through the gravitational lens? In this case, we're not looking at gravitational lensing. We're actually just looking at that stuff there. Um, the spectrum doesn't really so much get distorted as the source of the light gets spread out physically on the sky so that we can look at it in different places, which is fun because it means we can sample the stuff in between us and the source in different places, which is why we want to do this because um, otherwise we don't really have a good way of mapping things out. Okay. Are we already? Not quite. But you want to get your planning card right. Yes. All right. I'm going to share my screen over here so y'all can see what we're doing when we set up on the thing. I have to find email. And you don't want another PA. PA0. PA0. Thank you. No, I do not want GoFundMe. load. That's an image.
Okay, your options that are up there now. Okay, um, can we do, uh, what's the guide camera depth at right now? We have a longer exposure, John. I don't want to see all the little things. I've just seen them scroll yet. Do you? Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, I think it's right there in the middle. Okay. So I think we can send it. All right. We're gonna sign. Let's see. Suzuki Quad. Da, 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 science. Science. Okay. So the guide camera screen doesn't show you anything particularly interesting, but what I will show you is what it looks like um, really on the sky, which is this. You should ideally be able to see a big bright white thing there. And then these four blue dots surrounding that are four lensed images of a background source. So this is our first gravitationally lensed object. So the bright thing in the middle is a galaxy that's got enough mass in it that a source directly behind it, it's like gets spread out and turned into four images on the sky because the big galaxy in the center is acting like a lens. Um, and so this is a newly discovered one. It was only discovered very recently and in, in very Keck fashion. Somebody calls me up and says, hey, you're on the telescope tonight. Can you pretty please uh, verify this thing for me? Uh, because the, the, this is a collaborator of mine. He was actually one office over from me when I was getting my PhD. And so um, he, he knew that he could ask, hey, um, is there a chance that we can uh, verify this gravitationally lens system? Because we don't want to get scooped before somebody else does. And I figured I'd help a friend out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it's also exactly the science that I want to be doing tonight with these background gravitational sources. And so uh, that's why he asked. And that's why I said yes, because we get to do um, the, the the same thing. So that's kind of a testament to how we um, how we do science at, at Keck. A lot of times people are very, very collaborative when they're when they're going after the the same uh, goals and you know if if an object is brand new discovered and you we don't understand it yet uh you know you want to take every opportunity that you get uh to, to to try to make the measurement and figure out how things are going in this case we won't be spending a long time here we'll be only spending 20 minutes at this object and the reason is that all we're trying to do is verify the distance to the object. We're trying to verify that that wasn't just some happenstance configuration of blue things behind a big uh, thing, which is very, very rare. It's probably a gravitational lens. But I want to know how far away the blue dot is. And for that, I need the spectrum of the blue dots. And once I get the spectrum of the blue dots, I can measure the distance to the dots. Um, and that will be really fun, particularly if those blue dots are very far away. Um, because gravitational lensing, in addition to making things bigger on the sky, amplifies the light. So a lot of times we use gravitational lensing as the only way to see objects which otherwise are too faint to see in the starlight. The lens really acts like a magnifying lens and lets you see a lot of light. Um, so, you know, you're seeing brand new things being seen for the first time ever in this way, which is kind of fun. But at the same time, there's an, there's entirely the possibility that, that we've got it completely wrong. And we just don't know that yet. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you know whether or not we've got it. And, you know, uh, probably before our, our session is done this evening, but I want to be able to let Max go home and actually, you know, see his family and various other things instead of trying to live time data reduce for me. But 
Uh, let's see real quick. Ahmed, just for for you, I um I'm doing that new quad that was sent via email right now. Um, and after that exposure is done, we'll go to the the one that was from Slack earlier today. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. right. Let's see. Oh, how's the blue? See the blue. Okay. So what are we what are we hoping to do? We're hoping to verify the lens, um, A, that the lens is real. B, we're hoping that we can see um uh, how far away the, the background source is. And C, if I'm super duper extra plus up special lucky, um, we'll see interesting features in in the in the background object. We probably don't have enough time at the um aimed at uh this object to really get super duper high quality data where you can do science for intervening objects like we were doing that like we're going to be doing with objects for less than night but you know you never know you might get you might get uh lucky the you know the first red object is going to read out very soon if we're if we're super lucky we can figure out how far this thing away is um and then move on back to my science people taking over my telescope time it's ridiculous how dare they try to do interesting science how dare they and you know just for folks who have uh joined later if you if you have uh questions about what we're doing what i'm yammering about please um ask them in the chat um, there's going to be periods of time where I just have to kind of go into the nether zone, staring at the spectrum to see how how well it's um, it's doing. Now is about to be one of those times, uh, just to see what CCD I see. CCD readout but complete. I will share the screen of where I'm looking. There. Well, there's the bright guy. Oh, that's going to be tough. That's tough. Let's see. Roughly, what's the the width of a slice? One point one point. Okay, so this is 0.7 arc seconds away, and this is 0.7 arc. So this is one arc second away. This from this is one and a half. Oh, 1.4. Yeah, there. Yeah, set 0.7 plus 0.7 is 1.4. So now the question is on now's image, what is. Uh, 33 lens is central 10 seconds. Okay. So this image is about 30 by 30 arc. So this that stuff could be the doohickeys. It would be symmetric. Right. So yeah, because that each of the slices is twenty long, and then yeah, we'll be able to get a nice spectrum of that. Yeah, totally. Oh yeah. Ninety-two. Oh, that's. We're gonna get it. <laughs> it's pretty. I love this instrument. <laughs> Your instrument is very, very nice, Rosalie. It makes me very, very happy. I'm pleased to hear that. Let's see. Yeah, so uh, just in, in looking at the, the data in its raw form, that's really kind of difficult to understand just staring at it. Um, we can see that we've already easily detected the the big bright thing in the center 
I think we've detected the um, the lensed images on either side, and um, and in a, in a few minutes we may be able to to actually uh, reproject that onto a cube onto the sky. But uh, let's see if I can. I'll pull this back up again, show you why I'm optimistic about it. So I don't know if you can, yes, you can see my mouse. So my mouse right here, that bright thing was the bright galaxy that's making the gravitational distortion. And we're pretty sure that this fuzzy bit here, and it's fuzzy left to right, and this fuzzy bit up here, are two of the four lensed images. Um, and just for reference, what we were looking at before that was this. So there's the bright thing. And on either side here are the um, lensed objects. So I'm feeling pretty optimistic that we're, uh, we're, we're going to be seeing these things in glorious form. And then we're gonna go off and look at another one and another one and another one. And then um, unfortunately, after the, the shadow session ends, we're gonna be looking at a very, very close by galaxy. So we're gonna look at a tiny, tiny region between two galaxies that are smacking into each other. In fact, they've already made two passes and it's stripping the gas in between the two galaxies. And we're going to put the instrument aimed at that stripped gas in between the two to try to figure out what it's made of and how it's getting ripped apart. Um, I'll see if I can find a picture of it uh, just so that we, we get a sense of what we're looking, we're going to be looking at. And it's going to be spectacular when it's all done. But let's see if I can find a very good picture. Yeah. There we go. I'm going to share. Let's see, where did it go? There. So that's going to be our friend later on tonight, which is this beautiful set of interacting galaxies. The the blue galaxy is is passing by and and. Uh, stripping the, gal the, the the gas off of the red galaxy. We're going to try to confirm that suspicion by looking at the stream um, in its atoms and trying to understand the, the velocity. CCE the readout complete. So that's going to look really, really, really cool. But that's later on tonight. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, Rebecca says, so cool. Yes, it's, 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 it's wicked cool. Um, oh, uh, Let's see, that's, uh, Kyle, I don't know its NGC number, but it's ARP 282 um, in the, so uh, an astronomer named ARP did a, cal a catalog of really weird messed up things on the sky, which turned out to be interacting galaxies. Um, and the, and this is the 282nd object in the ARP catalog. I'm just going to pause for one quick second. I'll be right back.
All right, we're back. We were just letting Max go home. How dare we? And we were we were discussing the fact that I I am uniquely capable of breaking things, and usually I break the weather by my mere existence in the room. And this time I I managed to break software, but that's you know that's my special power. Um, so right now we're just in that that delicate waiting period where um, we wait for the new data. Oh dang, I didn't see that Jim Cowles left. Th Jim, thanks for joining us, even though you can't hear me anymore and you're not in Zoom anymore, but. Um, and, oh, I'm going to go make a cup of tea and Rosalie's going to go make a cup of tea. Go ahead in the chat, go put down what kind of tea you think that Rosalie is going to be getting, <laughs> um, you know, really important. Be creative. Ooh, how's it going? All right. Have you done a shadow, the scientist thing before? Oh, awesome. Yeah. We're doing one right now. Four two with um this is one of our another one of our telescope operators and um she's going to be running a shadow later on today so i guess people could just stay on shadow all night probably if it's the same thing, what, yeah. what time what time are you picking up um it's the second half guys so i guess it's after midnight oh i don't know, okay. I don't know. Right. you want to stay up really really late <laughs> like really late <laughs> you can jump back on shadow at, at, at midnight for what you um, I, th I think so, at least. That's what they told me yesterday when I showed it. So. Yes, yes, that's absolutely correct. We have another session. Uh, thank you all for being such an amazing collaborator at Cat Observatory. John, thank you all. Uh, with uh, Matthew Chatron, who's the... Oh! Yeah, yeah. Please help me read out complete. Yes, you, you, I'm sure, know him very well, John. Yes, but um, yeah, Matt, Matt actually jumped on at the beginning of our session so uh, yes should... yes he did and, and so on high res tonight yeah okay exactly i will drop the link to that session registration link to that session in the chat now thanks for mentioning it cool. so rebecca you said you came from from your observatory locally straight to this meeting what were you looking at uh tonight at your end Oh, let's see. CS Cornell. Oh, there's the link for that. Oh, smoke. Well, that's not particularly helpful. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, okay. So tonight, Matthew Chatron is doing um fossil collecting with andromeda globular clusters okay so this is really cool um if you don't want to stay up all night and and look at what matt matthew's looking at um the nearest galaxy kind of like our own is the andromeda galaxy it's a, a few million light years away um and in about a two billion years it's going to smack right into the milky way um but because it's very difficult to understand what our galaxy looks like and what its history is because we're stuck in it we do things like what i do for galaxies that are billions of light years away and try to understand early galaxies he's trying to look at globular clusters these balls of stars orbiting around andromeda and understanding that um and so he's using a a, a spectrograph which is very high resolution so you can look really in the details of of the atoms um, and he's going to be studying those globular clusters orbiting around Andromeda. And he's going fossil hunting. So he looks at globular clusters, presumably because he's looking at very, very, very old stars and trying to understand the cosmochemistry, the sort of lifetime evolution of the chemistry of, of the Andromeda galaxy. So that should be a lot of fun. And I'll be up all night. So I'll probably just wander over to the other control room and and, and annoy him remotely while you guys are doing the session. <laughs> but... Let's see, we are getting pretty close, um, only about, only a few more minutes until we get to move to our next target. And this is basically what we do all night, right? We, we, we sometimes, as in the case of a, of a target later on tonight, 
we uh, stay on a target a very long time because we need a, it's a very, very faint object or we want really, really high quality data. In the early stages, like what we're doing right now, we're on fishing expeditions. We're trying to see if something is interesting um, so that a year later or um, six, six months later, we'll come back and look at the object again. Okay, Rebecca says, I'm a member of the, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and they trained me to operate the 0.6 meter, so I volunteered to show this scope. So, Rebecca, I gave, I, I had a lot of fun with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, folks, the Alberta chapter, where um, I, I gave a talk a while back online, and it was a lot of fun. So, uh, big props to the RAS, RASC group. And one of these days, we should figure out uh, Prince George chapter. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's that's the fun thing about astronomy is we all really love what we're doing, whether or not, you know, it, it doesn't matter where we are on the planet and it doesn't matter uh, the, the size of the telescope. We all just love looking up with them and having a lot of fun. Um, so I am going to focus for a little bit on... Um, just getting us ready for the next object. So I'm gonna pause for, for just one second, although I'll leave the, the, the mic open just so that you can hear the fun interactions. So John, we got about a minute left, but I've uh, the next object is just gonna be index number 28 down at the bottom, CJ 1835. Okay. I'll go ahead and share the screen on this end so you can watch the acquisition sequence. Do I have the right thing? Yes, I do. Doop to doop. Okay, I think we're good to salute, John. Okay. What's always amazing to me um, about moving this telescope is so we're moving 300 tons, 300, more than 300 tons of stuff. DCV really readout, DCV complete. readout complete. Really fast on the sky and then getting it accurate mm -hmm. to a spot on the sky just supremely accurate like you know very 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 small patch on the sky and you can just tell the machine to go there and i i've never understood from an engineering sense how that works as well as it works oh we've got exquisite data there is one at civil hour So we're doing that process of acquiring. Okay, your field is at rest day now. Okay, I'm taking a guider image. Ahmed, are you online? Yes, I'm online. I can see it. I think you you are directly. Okay, so is these are these two dots up here yeah, that yeah. the two so, bright? Yeah, if if you check the Google sheet, you will see them there. So you have like two bright objects in the top. Yeah. And uh, the three images directly below it. John, could we um just take a, a little bit longer? 
exposure on the guider? We're at five, five seconds right now. But oh, okay. Um, well, here maybe I'll just I'll just change the stretch a little bit. I think I. Okay. Uh, do we want them centered? I think you know they're they're pretty close to the center. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me just give it the rename. Um, CJ eighteen. And 1835 setting object. Okay, John, we're good to go on our end. Okay. Uh, let's just, I just want to wait one second. Okay, we're good. Okay, now we will go. I mean, given how faint it is, we should probably do how long? 40, do you, minutes? 40 minutes, yeah. Do you think that'll be all right to get it up or? Do you think, it? Do you think 40 minutes would work? Uh, I think so. Do you, do, you, do you think that we need a full hour for it? I'd prefer not to. <laughs> so, okay, we can have like 40 minutes so, so we don't have uh, any heat or any observation for it. Oh, wait, so wait, this is what the 40 minutes it... right now. And there could be anything interesting in the red box. Oh, wait, this is the one that hold on one second. Sorry for the, the silliness over on my end, folks. Oh, okay. Doot, doot. Oh, yes, okay. I wonder how much, yeah, because the seeing is fairly good. So we should get pretty decent data okay. in 40 minutes. Yeah, let's let's try 40 um, and, uh, and then what am I gonna do? Then I'm going to, Let's see, did you, did you have a, a specific target you wanted to do next? One of the things that I wanted to do at some point was go and get a little bit more on J2222, but, uh, okay. but if there, go ahead. The, the Quillian target, some of them doesn't have any observation. Are there any ones at this RA yet though? Uh, I'm saying that Fulham doesn't have observation with KCWI and KTRM. Right. I'm just wondering if they're uh, up up yet. I thought they were at like one hours, RA. Okay. So, so in this case, we can do And then I do have to spend about an hour um, at a, a target that's not the, the lens stuff at all. Okay. So then we do uh, no, it's 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 a nearby ARP, ARP galaxy. Um, but if you have, let's see, we're at 1956. We could probably do. Almost cool. But All right, just checking. What, oh, that's so faint. What about the hyper supreme cam? Um, twenty-two twelve minus zero. Do we know anything about it? Uh, we don't have any observations for it. Okay, so I might do J twenty-two twenty-two and then that. Okay. And th and I'll just and do it that. Looks like an F quad here, so we'll be able to confirm it. The the hyper supreme cam, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll do J twenty two twenty two, 
and then I'll go to hyperspring cam. But we'll do two shots at this, the, the one we're at now. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry for the chit chat on my end. This is basically how the game works is um, we're trying to optimize the targets that we're viewing based off of the sky conditions, um, the very uh, the various science programs that we want to do, the things that we already know about the objects. In some of the cases, like you saw with the first one, we've never observed it before. In some of the other cases, we've observed it before, but maybe not at the same wavelengths. Um, in some of the cases, we've observed it a lot, and we really, really want to know more about a specific thing. And so this object that we're looking at right now, we've never done it before. Um, it, it, you know, it's been dis discovered in discovery images, but we're trying to, to understand what's going on with it. Um, and hopefully, oh, no, I'm sorry. The object we're on, we have observed before, but we've only observed with blue light. It was before the upgrade that Rosalie did to the instrument. And so we knew that the blue light was very interesting. We really wanted to get the red light. Now we have the instrument that can get the red light. And so we're going to do the red light. Dang it. And get all the science that we can. Um, let's see. Um, so one of the things I can... Um, talk about for a little bit while we're waiting for this to read out is how did how does this process work the proposal DCD process readout complete is typically there's the usual keys oh they're right up to the edge of the slicer aren't they Yeehaw. um typically what happens is that somebody will write a proposal for for telescope time and they're writing it about six to nine months in advance of when they're actually going to do the observing. And then that proposal goes off to a time allocation committee. And the time allocation committee is a bunch of scientists who look at it and say, oh, this is a really neat science idea, or this is a really novel use of the telescope or the instrument, and, and they award time. For an observatory like Keck, typically anywhere between four and seven times as many proposals are written than are accepted. That is to say, for every yes, there are four no's or seven no's, and sometimes up as much as 10. Um, so it's very competitive because it's the best telescope on the planet. Um, and then the, the if, if your telescope time is awarded, you uh, go and you, you do your observing. That's what we're doing right now. Um, and then one of two things happens. Um, if you find something exceedingly interesting and you have good enough data, then you start to write a paper about it and you try to publish it. Um, in the case of like what we're doing here, um, that one object, that new quadruple lens, may be something that that we can publish a quick note on. But in for most of what we're doing here, we're really trying to build up a sample of things. And so we, we won't be able to write the, the publication we could write a publication about each one of the individual things, but it's actually the statistics of the thing as a whole that matters, at least in the specific aspect of the science that we're trying to do. And so it's a labor of love because um, you have to do these observations and then you sometimes have to wait a year to do them again, and maybe a year to do them again. Um, while for other things, you you do one quick 20 minute observation and you find something really interesting, you write a paper. Um, so. Uh, but that's the that's the process of how how discovery works. And a lot of times we'll we'll do the observations. We'll go, we'll spend months churning on the data and realize we either need to look at it again in a different way, or um, it's just not as exciting as we thought it was. Um, and that's that's always a little bit frustrating when you have to reapply for the time every six months or every nine months or every year. But it's the process of how it works. It's served the community fairly well. Um, and you know, I, on the other hand, I, I'm a little bit lucky. No, I'm actually very, very lucky because, uh, I'm the chief scientist of the observatory. And one of the neat things that happens when you're the chief scientist of the observatory is that you get your own telescope top. And so 
I'm a super lucky individual in the sense that I'm given a block of time every year that I can I can use for my own on my own science um, without having to go through the the, the proposal process. But um, I try to use that time in the most collaborative way that I can. Um, and sometimes I, I give my time to the staff astronomers here. Um, sometimes I uh, work with uh, a very large collaboration because there's, you know, sometimes you need as many people pouring as much telescope time as you can into a project. And on nights like tonight, I work with um, a specific group of collaborators where we all share the same specific science question and they don't have necessarily the same flavor of access to the telescope that I do. So I kind of have the best job on the planet, which is, you know, all day I get to, to, to work with uh, amazing folks on getting the telescope ready and, and getting new instruments and doing all that stuff. Mostly all I do is sit in my office and make PowerPoint presentations. But um, on, on very lucky nights in the year, I get to, I get to um, you know, use the, this, this amazing machine and the amazing machines bolted to it to, to, to do a lot of fun science. So I have a pretty good job. If you have the chance to be the chief scientist at an observatory, take that chance. You're going to really enjoy it. Ding dong. So let's see if I can show something interesting on the data that just came in. I'm going to pull that up here. Sure. Okay. So what we're really looking for um, in these things, these bright things are typically the stuff that are nearby. It's this stuff, the really, really faint things. These are the faint galaxies, the faint lensed galaxies. And this is why in many cases you have to um, go back again and again and again and again. There's enough data here in this smooth, in this fuzzy thing, to be able to determine some basic properties of the object that we're looking at, um, its distance or various other things, but it's not enough um, data to do a really detailed study. Now, one of the things that needs to happen along the way is there's a lot of extra noise and in instrumental artifacts in this image. And we have to get rid of them. You can see these vertical lines. These vertical lines are emission by atoms in the Earth's atmosphere. So they're radiating light. CCD readout complete. At specific wavelengths um, relative to the oxygen, the nitrogen, the, the, all the various atoms in the atmosphere. And that's putting noise on the, the data that we care about. The data that we care about is this light that's going left to right. And you can see little notches in it. So like if I look at the data here, you can see all these, these notches in it. That's absorption due to something in the atmosphere of the thing or something in the circumgalactic medium of a galaxy. I think the thing that we were really looking at here is that here is the bright background object and here are two of the lensed features near it. So a lot of stuff has to happen to this data to turn it into a, a scientifically useful thing. And that's what the software that was going on with, with Max and others in the background, we're trying to optimize the software so that we could get quick looks at what we were looking at tonight. Usually you do a quick look to see, hey, did I point at the right thing? The good news is that we did multiple times. Um, and then you run it again very carefully to try to extract the most um, the most amount of science that you can out of uh, out of the data, and that process is oftentimes very detailed. Um, Kyle, thanks very much for joining us. And I always see this too late in the chat. I say goodbye to people after they've already left. But so let's see. We've got only about tenish minutes left in in the evening. So you know, now would be a, a, a wonderful time if you have questions because we're I think we're in the sort of in the middle space between um between exposures and things like that so if you if you have a a burning question about something that you've seen this evening whether or not it's the telescope the instrument um the science the the people that make things happen feel free to to type a question in the chat i'd be happy to answer it um because i'll 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 probably have to drop off at the hour so that i can 
start playing around with the, the data that we've gotten and optimizing the rest of the night. Let's see, have you ever had a project at this telescope uh, from Ben? Um, the answer is yes. It's a it's an object. Um, remember how I started the, the evening talking about uh, the quasars? Um, when I was a graduate student, we were trying to figure out what was happening in the universe when it was about three minutes old. And the three-year-old, three-minute-old universe looked very, very different than it does now. In fact, it, it had only um, protons and neutrons. It hadn't even gotten cold enough for protons and neutrons to sit on top of each other and make the first nuclei. But at about three minutes, the expansion of the universe got it cold enough that those protons and neutrons could jump onto each other and make the first nuclei. And the race was on to try to count um, through a complicated process that, that you know only a grad student would love, um, those numbers of protons and neutrons in the universe. And it turns out to be a very, very difficult process. You had to look in special places in, in the universe where no other chemical processes had happened for 13 and a half billion years. And we looked at hundreds of quasars to try to find clouds that contained this, this material that had been sort of left alone since three minutes after the bang. Um, and when I was a graduate student, they had only found three of them anywhere in the universe that had worked. Um, and uh, one night I was using Keck one um, and I had, a, I had a hunch that an object was gonna work out really well. My thesis advisor told me I shouldn't do it. And I went ahead and did it anyway. And it turns out I was right. Um, and then we proceeded to observe that object with uh, the telescope over many years for something like 30 hours of telescope time, um, which on a 10 meter is, is a very, very long, long time. Um, but that object allowed us to count the number of atoms in the universe. And it was really neat because at the time there was a debate, big debate going on in whether how much normal matter there was in the universe. Um, and it turns out we we helped provide part of the solution to that, which is, you know, if you ask, add up all the energy and matter in the universe, only about 5% of it is atoms. And we helped make that discovery. So that was a lot of fun. Um, do you know the distance of the four blue dots now, Richard asks? I don't quite know yet. Uh, we will. I, I don't know if I'm going to get to know, but I think I will figure out a way to 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 get the answer to y'all. Maybe I'll put it on the. Um, I'll ask Jamika to put it on the Shadow the Scientist Twitter account. If I get the distance, I'll have Jamika put. Uh, we'll put an image up of it, and and we'll put the distance to the dots. Um, Jamika asks, how long in general will it take to analyze uh, tonight's data to get detailed insights? Um, the answer typically to that is it's either going to take me. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, or it's going to take me two years because of the nature of this. You know, I'm going to know very well the distance to the four dots, and that's a tomorrow afternoon, or maybe even a couple hours from now. Or in the case of some of the other ones, I'm going to have to keep coming back and build up that sample. Um, and and uh, some of that is data analysis, and some of that is just building up a sample of significant enough size to to have DCD readout. Complete. Um, Roger asked, was it the measurement of the deuterium de abundance? Yes, it was. Uh, deuterium is the, the isotope of hydrogen where a neutron sticks onto the proton. And the amount of deuterium in the universe, deuterium was created only in the Big Bang when the universe was about three minutes old. That's the only place it's made. Everywhere else it's destroyed. And that's why it's special. You want to find it um, in a place that hasn't been inside of a star, a star or haven't been destroyed because you're looking at the original amount of deuterium that there was in the universe. And so if you know how nuclear physics works, and we thought we did, you can measure the amount of deuterium relative to other things. And that's uh, that's how we figured out the, the total number of protons and neutrons in the universe. Um, and and that was my my yeah that was my thesis project was uh, built around the search for those deuterium objects and then a couple of ones that that I had found along the way. And that tells you the cosmic density of of ordinary baryonic matter. Yep, because if you if you know the nuclear physics right and you can count the deuterium, you can backtrack that to the total number, um, at least relative to the rest of the universe of of, of protons and neutrons out there. And John, is that because the density of uh, the frequency of collisions goes like density squared, right? Because if you have 
and and so that tells you how, how, how efficiently you produce deuterium versus not. Is, I think, is, is that the connection between the deuterium abundance and the cosmic density? Um, yeah, it's basically of of the nu the nuclear production rate relative to other things, because depending on the density, the amount of the stuff, the the neutrons can either glom onto protons and become deuterium, or the deuterium can then glom onto other things in certain ways and build up helium hmm. and isotopes of helium. And the rate of producing either helium and having it all become helium or some of it become deuterium is a very, very sensitive function of how many protons and neutrons there are in the universe. If there's too much of it, it basically all goes to helium. And if it's if there's too little of it, um, we don't get any helium and and we don't see the isotopes in, in the ratios that we do. I see. So it's a balance between two nuclear reactions, one that yeah. produces deuterium, one that utilizes that deuterium, therefore destroys it. And this process happens in the cores of stars too for a brief period of time. And it's, it's how how we build up um, the helium in, in stars. But in this case, we had the entire universe was at the temperatures and density of the nuclear reactions that are happening in stars. And that's why they call it Big Bang nucleosynthesis. It's the origin of the, the heavy, the, the elements, at least their nuclei, but in the Big Bang, instead of gravity trying to crunch stars together and make make things, um, got probably time for one or two more questions. Richard asks, "How do you determine the amount of time you were gather light of a particular object? Does the software keep sampling the CCDs during the time, or do you allow the CCD?" So we we set the exposure time, the amount of time that we're looking at the object, based off of two factors. Um, experience tells us approximately how long we know we have to integrate to get a correct answer. And detector physics tells us how many times we need to sample that because, um, in fact, you know, this, 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 uh, when you look at the one on, on the right, you can see all those white streaks are those cosmic rays. If you get too many of them, it just makes your data almost unusable. And so you have to build up multiple samples of that and smoosh them together to get the final answer. And that's why you're taking exposure times, which are short on one set of detectors and long on another set of detectors. But to get the science answer, you have to go back and look at the data and say, did I get the amount of signal to noise that I need to answer a specific science question? So in the case of the four dots, we certainly got the signal to noise. In case of many of the other things, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a while. Uh, it, it will need many, many hours. Um, and then, you know, do a lot of CD, CDs to accumulate the light and download the data at the end of the time. We, we just did the, the CCDs. We do one exposure time. It downloads. Um, and we typically do four red exposures for one blue one. Uh, what What is the title of my thesis paper? I, I My thesis, uh, my th thesis was called... Um, Cosmology from the high redshift intergalactic medium, but that that paper from the my favorite object is um, the deuterium to hydrogen abundance to ratio towards a fourth quasar colon HS O one O five plus one six one nine about as boring as you can get, but HS O one O five plus one six one nine is is my uh, my 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 favorite quasar in the in, in the universe. Yes, very catchy title. It it it's very popular at parties. Um, I, I I believe. Um, the Postal Service titled their their new album HSO one hundred five plus one six one nine because that just makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think we're coming to a close for m my session here. I don't know, Jamika, how you the close. Exposure now? The CD readout. Yes. The CD readout. Actually, complete. what what we can do is, um, John P, if you could just offset uh, okay. by. I've oh, you've already started? Then never mind. No offset. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, John, I want to thank you for hosting yeah. your first Shadow the Scientist session. Thank you. <laughs> never mind, John. How much longer are you going to spend here? Another, tw another like 20 minutes. Favorite. Another 20 minutes. Sorry. Um, We've got, I recognize several names on the Zoom call. Annalisa from South Africa has been connecting for many, many times. Huh? Um, 
Rob, Rob and I actually met in person. I met Paul in person. I met Jamaica in person, of course, and you, John. Um, no, it's really nice to see familiar faces and new faces in the in the group. So, well, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. I apologize if it was a little bit hectic between going back and forth and blah blah blah, and then suddenly silence. But that's actually a pretty good description of almost everything I do. So. <laughs> But uh, I wish everybody a, a pleasant evening, and um, and I want to thank Jamika and, and and Raja for giving me the opportunity to to join you tonight. It's a it's a wonderful program, and and I I promise to be back. Thank you, John. All right. Thank you so much, John, for joining us, and thank you to everyone uh, for being here with us, John. This was an absolutely amazing session. What a thrill to be able to get a newly identified uh, gravitational lens object! How fantastic! We wish you best for the rest of the evening, and for the rest of you, have a great rest of your evening, afternoon, or day. Aloha. Aloha.